Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Well, folks, today you are in for a treat. We're going to talk to Raika Zatabchi, an Iranian-American filmmaker based in Los Angeles. Raika's directorial debut, Madaran, was seen at film festivals around the world, winning multiple jury awards and qualifying her for the 89th Academy Awards in 2016. Raika's short documentary, Period, End of Sentence, which is now streaming on Netflix, is about a group of village women in northern India who start a sanitary pad business in an effort to improve feminine hygiene and destigmatize menstruation. Along with the film's release, Raika's film team co founded the nonprofit The Pad Project to fight the stigma of menstruation and improve feminine hygiene worldwide. Period double qualified for the Academy Awards in 2018, winning jury and audience awards at Michael Moore's Traverse City Film Festival and Cleveland International. The film also took home jury and audience awards from AFI Fest, among many others, and won the Oscar this year in the documentary short category. Rika's passion is telling stories that bring awareness and action to little-known social causes. The characters she puts on screen tend to be captivating, charismatic, and at times heartbreaking as she reveals their journeys through their own narrative. Now let's listen to this fascinating conversation with Rika, which takes us from her roots as an Iranian-American high school student in Los Angeles all the way to the stage of the 2019 Academy Awards. So where'd you go to film school? I went to USC film school. I graduated in 2016, um, August 2016. Um, and I started making period end of sentence. Um, I was approached to direct it literally right out of film school. It was like a week after I graduated. Wow. Um, and I was at the time kind of like, what am I going to do? Because I knew I wanted to be a director, but you know, being a director is really hard because it's not like you start getting hired to direct stuff right away. You know, it's like a constant, um, fight to, to build your portfolio while you're trying to stay afloat and, and, um, and like make rent and pay your student loans back and, and be an adult. So I was driving for Uber um, while I was making the film, the documentary. Um, I was PAing on sets and freelancing and, and like doing random production design on like little short films and, you know, barely making any money doing that. But um, oh, and then I would shoot and direct actors reels with my roommate. <laughs> he would produce and edit them and I would um, direct them and my boyfriend would shoot them and, you know, that became like a little source of income on the side as well. And we're just kind of like doing anything that we could to stay afloat. So let's, let's back up a little bit. So USC film school, um, where, where did you uh, go to undergrad or to um, high school? USC was undergrad. Yeah. Um, and I don't plan on going to graduate school. <laughs> um, basically I started filmmaking 10 years ago in high school. I was 15 and um, I was doing theater and I always wanted to do theater or be in entertainment somehow. My sister, my older sister is an actress and I was kind of looked up to her and um, growing up in my house, it was, we were always looking like watching movies for performance and analyzing them. It was just like, you know, even my parents who aren't actors or aren't necessarily in the entertainment industry, they were super into that. So that's what we would do. Um, and so I, I was, I was eventually like, I really want to get into on-camera acting. Um, you know, I want to like step away from theater and, and like advance into the entertainment industry. And, um, I basically was like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm in high school and I'm not going to like, you know, homeschool and go do full-time acting and I need an agent. So I was like starting to think about, you know, how you start to lay the foundation of an acting career <laughs> in Hollywood. Um, and one of my thoughts was, oh, I think, 
maybe it'll be beneficial if I take like a film class at my high school, you know, maybe learning about what happens, like how you make a film or like what happens behind the camera will help me learn what to do in front of the camera. And so I took my first like film. It was, I think it was called TV video (laughs) class. Um, Hallie Kessler was my teacher and I still keep in touch with her. I love her. Um, but yeah, I started doing that and just making like shitty little things on camcorders and stuff. And, um, and I really liked it because I was like, wow, the, the feeling that I, um, that I had when I would act, like it it felt very fulfilling and gratifying because you feel like you can like start to mold something within you, you know, yourself as an actor, um, I felt like I was able to do that like all across the board when I was making a film, you know, it felt like directing was awesome because you just have control over everything like editing and the sound and music, the music that you put in your film and where you want the camera to be. Um, what you're trying to say, like the, what story you're trying to tell, you know, all those things like were really gratifying to me. And I, um, and then I went to my first ever film festival, my, my, teacher was like, Hey, there's this thing called the Orange County Film Festival. You got to go. And I was 15 and, uh, I went with my mom and it was in my hometown in Irvine. Um, but it was this high school film festival and you enter and it's like, it literally was like a mini Academy Awards. And now I've been to the Academy Awards. So I can literally say it was a little (laughs) Academy Awards. And it was such a cool experience. I remember thinking, and this is a high school film festival, like for high school students. The the students being awarded here are like 16, 17 years old. Um, and, and I was able to watch some of their films. I mean, we were watching like music videos and short films. And I was so blown away and so impressed that like someone my age was doing that. I was like, oh my God. Inspired. Yeah, I was so inspired and so inspired to see that like right in my own backyard, there's a whole community of filmmakers who are my age and their mentors supporting them. And that I could be a part of this program. I literally sat in the, in the audience and I was like, I want to be up on that stage next year. And I was, cause I, you know, I entered the program. The program is called Film Ed Academy of the Arts. So they're really unique in that it's, basically this other film ed is like another, it's a company that comes in and works with, I think, um, 10 or so high schools in Orange County. And they're basically like an extension of the film programs. So they'll offer like free film workshops, um, in the summertime, Oh my gosh! which is incredible. That's and you so get cool. access to like hundreds of thousands of dollars of gear. Yeah. Like I was like, I was a high school student and they were entrusting me with like a with like a Veracam, which is like an industry standard camera. And I was like carrying like a Panasonic HPX 500s on, on my shoulder. And I was like 16 and shooting like football, you know, football games. I didn't know what was going on in the football game. And I still don't know what goes on in football, but <laughs> I was shooting that stuff. Um, and it was just so incredible and empowering, I think, to see that like, you have these mentors who are so like they believe so much in in the talent and in in, in um, encouraging talent that they're willing to like do all of this for for these kids who have never made films before and to have someone believe in you so much and say yeah like you can do it here take the camera I don't care like you know I'm not worried about you breaking it. Um, it's really empowering and it really makes you feel at a young age that like the sky's the limit and that really there, there should be nothing that, you know, should hold you back. Well, that process, the filmmaking process to me and thinking back when I was younger and in high school, it seems like it's not very accessible, like, you know, to, to most people. So what a great program to be able to show kids that this is something that they can do. And, you know, here's the equipment, Right, go for it. And I think I'm understanding truly the value of community as well now. Um, I understood it before, but you don't understand it until you're like thrusted into the entertainment industry and you're like a kid and you're just trying to figure out how to navigate your way into the world. But it creates a community. Like I literally went to a bar with 
people who were in my program last night. And your high, all school, fil- your high school, program? my high school program, they're oh. all filmmakers. Now one of them just directed, uh, his first feature film is on to direct his second feature film. He's like signed to CAA. Another one like is leading, um, like the leading, um, videographer and like part of the head of the marketing department of a high fashion brand. And I mean, it's crazy. Like, the community that you build and these are all my friends. So they're always like available collaborations as well. Um, and Dave Junker like was my mentor and all of our mentor cause he's the head of film at Academy of the arts. And he also started orange County film festival. So what happened was I was 15 when I started and when I joined film ed and I got like advanced film education in the summertime. It was my junior year going into, I'm sorry, it was the summer going into my senior year of high school. Uh, and then I made my first music video, like my senior year like of high school. Like an MTV style music video? <laughs> I wouldn't call it MTV style because <laughs> film ed is very like story driven. So um, I remember like always tell the story. That's one thing Dave always taught us. Always be character. Always tell the story. Like always focus on those things because that's really like the heart of any film that you watch. You know, it was always like, hey, you have access to this really top notch gear, but don't let that like drive you. Don't let that get in your way of really getting to the heart of characters and story. So like my first music video, um, it wasn't an MTV style music, but it was totally narrative. And it was, um, it was like three different vignettes, um, on different couples who were facing, um, challenges. Like one of them was, um, an interracial couple. One of them was a homosexual couple. One of them was, um, interreligious couple. And like, I had, I, like, I had something to say when I was 16, clearly, yeah. you know, like I was focusing on, on these stories. Um, and it's crazy because like, I'm still focusing on those stories, you know, I still have like, that's still in me. Um, and, and it's just been nurtured over the years, um, you know, up until this point. You know, yeah. it's, it's just been nurtured and it's really, I owe it to Dave Junker and the film at Academy of the Arts team. Like, so, so these ba- people are incredible. Back when, in, when you were 15, mm-hmm. um, so that was 10 years ago, you're 25. Yeah. I'm 25 now. It okay. was 10 years ago. So that I'm trying to get a sense of the technology. Was that like, you couldn't have shot on a phone, like an iPhone back then. Like it, the, I could have. You could have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so, why would you? Right. When you, you have, have like, access to all that equipment. I'm yeah. Just and then to... and on top of that, it's not just the gear. You're getting like, they're literally training you how like uh, in Final Cut. That was like when I first started, I started editing on Final in, Cut. In high school. In high school. Wow. And they're training you like, this is, this is how you cut movies. Like, this is how you cut a story together. Make sure it's cohesive. Make sure we know what's going on. Make sure we, you know, the character has... Um, a struggle and you're, you know, you're following it and tracking and teaching you story structure and arcs and, um, you know, even teaching you like the only experience I ever had making any type of documentary was at film ed, not even at USC film school. Like I was getting top notch film education that was, you know, like comparable to what the film education I was getting at USC at 16 years old for free in my high school. Right. Yeah. So the the thing that sparked your interest in film was that first year when you saw that high school Academy award happening and then the next year you were in it. Exactly. I mean, it's not that it sparked it. I mean, I've always been interested in film. Like my favorite film ever is Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring, which is hilarious because it's like so far away from any type of film I would ever make. Um, but I was so inspired by, it and I literally watched it when I was like 11 and I thought this is a perfect movie aside from the orcs, of course, cause they terrified me, but I thought <laughs> this is a perfect movie. Like, I was able to watch it and I don't think I could quite articulate it because I didn't have the knowledge at that point, filmmaking knowledge at that point, but I really felt it in my bones. Like, wow, the, it's beautiful. Like every part of it is so beautiful. And it felt like the perfect kind of concoction to me. Um, so I was always really interested in film and knew I wanted to 
eventually pursue film, whether it be acting or something behind the scenes. Um, but it wasn't until that moment when I went to the first Orange County Film Festival where I literally was like, this is possible. Because it felt like when you watch a film and you think about, you know, if you're not a filmmaker and you're, it looks daunting. Like yeah. you think about how do you make that? I mean, it's right. just, it seems like the biggest mountain. Well, especially a Peter Jackson film. <laughs> especially or a Peter Jackson that yeah. probably took like 10 years to make. Right. Um, yeah. So basically I, I graduated from high school and I immediately started working with film ed. I became an intern like a month out of high school. I started working with them and literally the next summer I was teaching their workshops. I was teaching directing oh at gosh. their high school film workshops. Now this just goes back to Dave Junker and Christine Vu and, and the team at Film Ed Academy of the Arts just having this um, completely like creating this completely safe space and just saying like, hey, we know you're 18 and we know you've never like truly directed a film, but we believe in you and we see something in you and we believe that you can can do this and you can teach this course. And I literally learned directing through like putting together this curriculum. So yeah, you, so you're teaching Kids High school that, students that are like a year younger than you. yes, <laughs> how to I make was. films. That's amazing. Yeah, it was scary. So, what was the the path to USC? How did how did that happen? So, um, when I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go to film school. At that point, I just knew you know it wasn't really going to be financially feasible for my family. So, um, so I did community college for a few years. Um, and I was worried about that because, and I was in this very like, oh, should I do it? Should I go to film school or should I just like not do it and just work on sets and just make my way? Um, but education has always been really important to me. Um, and I think my family also really wanted me to have that like core foundation, that film education at a film school. So um, I did community college um, and I got through all my GEs and I was working at film ed and um, and, you know, that was my source of income. That was my entrance into the film world. That was my, like, supplemental film education at the time. That's what kept me afloat and alive, my soul alive. Um, and and then basically I, you know, I put together an application. I submitted it to USC and then um, I was accepted. And I was so happy I was accepted because I had only applied to UCLA and USC at the time. And um, I got rejected from UCLA. So <laughs> if it weren't for USC, I don't, I don't really know if I would have ended, you know, if yeah. I would have gone to school. Well, that's a tough school to get into as well. Yeah. I mean, USC. That's, yeah, well, impressive. So what is that a two year or four year program? So or? it's a two year because I transferred in. So I yeah. transferred in my junior year and then um, my junior year, um, a very hard time for me in my life very hard because my dad actually um, was diagnosed with lung cancer when I was a senior in high school, like towards the end of my senior year. And that was when I was really getting into, getting into like f actually making films at that point too. Um, so it was really challenging for me, uh, the that kind of time, that transition from like graduating high school to, you know, yeah, moving away from home for the first time. And living alone when you know that, you know, your, your dad has cancer and it's like, you know, it's getting, it's getting worse and worse. Um, so that was a really challenging time for me. And, um, I, you know, I was at my first year of film school and, uh, literally it was like spring break. Um, we were working on our first project, our first film that I was going to be directing, um, and this was like the first real like narrative film, no, no music video. Like this was like my first narrative project I was going to direct. Um, and so, you know, I had like my producer and cinematographer and we laid all the groundwork. Um, and at that point, USC budgets you like gives you $1,500 to make the film, which is hilarious to me because you're paying like $48,000 a year in tuition and you get like $1,500 to make your first movie. Right. I think it's like pretty funny. Um, but that's how USC's whole thing is like, it's not about the money. It's not about the gear. You know, it's not about getting like top notch equipment or f facilities, access to those facilities. It's literally about story. 
Um, and it's about like the process and the journey and like being knee deep in it and understanding it like at its core without all the bells and whistles. Right. And that's what I love. Like, I really love that about USC because it felt a lot like film ed to me in that sense. Um, but I digress anyway. So I was, um, you know, we laid all the groundwork and we were ready to go literally, um, like a week away from shooting. And, um, my dad's condition just like declined rapidly. And so I, I left and I went home. Um, and it was literally like spring, like s be right before spring break. And my dad passed away at that point and I was 21. Um, and I was like a shell of a human being. I mean, my whole family, you know, my whole family was, it was a really challenging time. Um, cause I was really close to him as well. And it's just really close to my family. Um, so yeah, so, so basically I think what was happening was there was this kind of push and pull of like, do I go back to school or do I kind of sit the semester out? And I was, I was really, I think, angry and upset that like this was my circumstance and I was seeing like my peers and other students, like their circumstance was so different. They were like out there making movies, right? having their time of their lives They're doing not it. dealing with trauma. And, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I really wanted that. And I was just frustrated. Like, why do I have to give that up? You know, if this is what I'm experiencing right now, if this is like what's going to help me, why do I have to give that up? So I was just like, I'm going back to school. So it was literally like less than a week later and spring week was over and I went back to school and I was like, I want to make the film and I want to make it like bigger than a $1,500 budget. So, um, you know, and I wasn't so like, I think confident or, um, at this point, like I was really struggling, you know, it really took, it really took like, um, my boyfriend, Sam Davis, who's like my best friend for so many years at film. Um, he was my best friend at, at that point at film school for only like six months, but we were, we had like a very instant connection. He really helped me. Um, Tenny and my best friend really helped me. Um, Avery Regan, who was like one of my really close friends at USC. They really, like, I literally remember it. I'm sorry. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I literally remember like, Avery knocking on my door one morning, my apartment door, because I hadn't gotten out of bed to go to class. And she like brought me breakfast and she literally pulled me out of bed. And it was like, it was, it was because of that that I was able to like keep doing it, you know, keep making films, keep like, keep going on when you're just like a kid in the middle of Los Angeles with, you know, it was a really hard time. So, so did you have a chance to talk to your dad before he passed about what what he wanted for you and the you know what he was hoping for you vocationally yeah. or career wise? Yeah, or? I mean my dad like I think he was very proud and he knew like he kind of always knew that I had this like just undying tenacity and that I would like really just do anything to, to make it happen for myself, you know? And then I was so lucky to have that support. You know, I had the support from my dad. I had it from my mom, from my sister. I had it from, you know, my whole film ed community. And, um, it's just like, you know, I, I just feel so grateful every day that like I'm able to do this because of the people that I have around me. That's and so many people don't get to do it, you it, know? It's incredible. The, the it's like you don't win an Oscar at 25 by yourself. Like right. you do it because you have people who have helped you get there, you know? Well, what's amazing hearing that about your family and the support that you got and also from the community is it seems like a career in the arts and especially something as, as ambitious as film. Yeah. Um, is something that parents would be afraid of their kids pursuing. Right. You know, like, why don't you, do, you know, at least have a backup plan. Right. You know, um, but it, it sounds like they were just fully behind. Super. Behind you. On yeah. That. I remember like the day that my USC acceptance letter came in the mail, like my dad knocked on my door at seven in the morning and 
it was the knock was so loud and so aggressive. I like jumped out of bed and he swings the door open and he's sobbing. And I was like, oh, my God, who died? What happened? And he's just like, I'm so proud of you. And he shows me the red envelope. Um, it like meant so much to him. It really did. It meant a lot oh. to, to both my parents. Um, so. So basically, when I when I had um, gone back to USC, I like with the help of my classmates and my peers, we did like a Kickstarter campaign and we got together. I think it was like 10 grand or something. Um, and we decided we're going to make the film in the summer. So like right when the semester ended, we went into production and I was able to like realize my vision. You know, it was I was able to make this like something that was a lot bigger and felt like a, a real movie. And we got the whole class to work on the film. Um, and, and then we got like an executive producer, incredible guy who's like, I believe in you, gave us some more money and totally like championed the project. And um, I made my first narrative film, which was a totally Iranian language film, um, which meant a lot to me too, because my dad, like, you know, I'm Iranian, both my parents are Iranian and my dad just like is a, was a very Iranian guy. And, um, and I really wanted to make an Iranian film because it honestly felt like um, me connecting with him in some way by doing that. So we made the film and the film was, um, I think it helped me. What was the name of it? Madadon. Mataron. Mataron or Mataron. Oh, <laughs> you want to say it in Mataron. English. Yeah. yeah. Um, 10, 10 minute short film, Iranian language. And it's set in Iran. Um, it's about a mother who has to decide whether to end or spare the life of the man who killed her son. Because um, with Islamic Sharia law, basically the victim's family has the right to decide whether or not they're going to hang the killer or or um save him so she pardons him in the moment um and it's just a really it was based on a true story and it was a really beautiful story and i thought you know something that was really positive that came out of iran and it wasn't even about like islam it was about like a mother having the power and and using it for good um so that was my first film and it I mean, it was, it was great. Like it was a true directing experience. It was like, there were like 80 people in the film and there were extras and there was like an execution scene. And I mean, it was a really big task for a first time, you know, yeah. filmmaker well, for a kid. What are the logistics of a 21 year old going to Iran <laughs> to shoot a movie like this? So I know the version in your head is probably a lot more cinematic than it actually was, but we shot it in San Pedro. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is in uh, California, oh, not far okay. from so LA. You didn't, you didn't go to Iran. You, we didn't go to Iran. Um, you said it takes place in Iran, but it's, it's, not, yeah, it's, but it's not shot in it's, Iran. No, yeah. it's set in Iran. Okay, yeah. So we shot it in San Pedro, and we shot it at Fort MacArthur, which is this cool, like, old U.S. military fort. Um, and And it really, I mean, I'm proud to say, like, even today, like, having, I think, grown a lot more as a filmmaker, I watch it back now, and I'm like, wow, that was really, you know, that felt really authentic. Um, that's been the feedback, too, from a lot of Iranians. But um, it was an incredible experience, and I really, like, really fell in love with filmmaking then. I mean, I had always loved it, but it's not till you really have your first big experience where you're, like tired and just like there's so many fires you have to put out every day and it's exhausting and you're giving everything of yourself to this thing um and I just walked away from it and I was like wow I felt full you know like it helped me come back to life after my dad's passing do you still have family in Iran I do yeah and did, what do they think of that short <laughs> they think it's great a lot of um like the Iranian community has responded really positively because it's a positive story about Iran, you know, and you don't see that often. And I, I like to change that narrative. So after that summer, um, you finished shooting by the end of summer? Yes, yeah. we finished. We actually only shot for two days 
And then it took us like four months to edit the film. Yeah. Um, and Sam Davis, my boyfriend, he edited the film. He shot the film as well. Um, so it was very scrappy and fun. It was great. It was really fun. And what, what happened with that movie? So it did festivals all over the country. It did festivals um, uh, around the world. Um, it won a ton of filmmaking awards and um, it helped me get an agent and a manager when I was st still in school. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was really great. And, and it really like, you know, I think the one thing that um, a lot of students don't get exposure to when they're in school is they'll make the film, but like the life of the film ends after the film is made and screened once in a theater at school. Yeah. Um, and, and the really important thing to, to learn is like, w what is the life of the film after you've made it, you know, because that's really where people, I mean, it takes on, it's a whole other phase in the filmmaking journey and it takes on a whole new form. Um, and people need to see the film and con conversations need to be started about it and, um, film festivals, um, awards, like distribution, like all of that stuff is so, it's like the really heavy business side of film that a lot of students don't ever get to learn. So I was really like grateful that I was learning a lot of these things while I was still at school. Um, and you were not learning them in school. You were learning them through. Yeah. Just, I mean, you can't learn them in school because yeah. in school you're just making the films. Like yeah. no one's really, I mean, there's a class where they're like, okay, you could distribute it by doing this and you can submit it to film festivals, but it's not until you do it and you really show up to the film festivals and you experience how to you do when you really like learn how to navigate this other world right. that is often really uncomfortable for filmmakers because we're not you know, used to being in the spotlight. We're just always in the background and we're there just doing the art, you know, making the work. Um, but it's a whole other process and it's very key and important. How do you market the film? Like, you know, the narrative that you create in marketing the film is just as important, if not more important than the narrative in your film, because no one will see it otherwise. Right. Right. So, you know, that's something I learned throughout period and a sentence, that process. Um, and, and it was just modern was like a really great experience in that sense where like, you know, I was getting so much education out of it. And like, to this day, I'm still learning. Um, I'm still learning like things from Madaran and period and a sentence, like continued things, you know, Madaran never got distributed, but period and a sentence did. And that just like, you know, that, that was like a whole other experience. And I learned how to do an Oscar campaign. Like that's crazy. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about that. But before we talk about the Oscar campaign, tell us about you're finishing up with your editing of Moderon. It doesn't get distributed. Um, and then you're still in your senior year at that point at film school. Uh, Moderon is finished uh, and I'm doing festivals and I'm at my se senior year at USC. And then, um, and then I directed a thesis film at USC. So, um, in your, in your senior year, how, how does period end of sentence, um, hit your radar if it does at all during your actual senior year? So it was right when I had graduated. Um, but before that I had worked on, I was in school and I had worked on in the summertime, a production, called Cobalt 60 and it was a short that my friends um, Jake Bernstein and Brandon Verdi were making and Sa Sam was DPing the film and I was doing um, like helping them with um, art department um, and there it was there that I met Garrett Schiff who is um, a producer and writer and Garrett had known, known Sam through another project Love and Honor that they shot in Michigan years ago it was Sam's first production he ever worked on as an intern um, so you know Sam had a great relationship with Garrett and I met Garrett there very briefly um, but that was it and then you know less than a year later I just graduated from film school and um, yeah, Garrett, Garrett called me up and was like, hey, my daughter, Ruby, is in a club at her high school, and there's this issue of women and girls who um, 
have to drop out of school when they begin to menstruate. Um, and there's a lack of access to sanitary hygiene products where they are. Um, and this happens a lot in developing countries and also in the United States as well. And they want to make a documentary about it. Um, and they want to install this low-cost sanitary pad-making machine that this Indian man, Mr. Morgan Anthem, had invented to combat the issue. Um, they want to install that in, in a village in India. Um, I know you've never made a documentary before, but I've seen your short Madaran and I loved it. Um, you know, let me know if you're interested because we need a young female director. And I was on a plane um, headed to Scotland to go see my family. Um, I have family in England, so we were like, you know, doing a little vacay. <laughs> um, so I, I was literally like boarding the flight and I'm so glad I took his call because I was going to push it and I wouldn't have talked to him probably for, you know, another couple weeks. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I, th I was like, okay, Garrett, I'm, I'm going to get back to you. And I literally like, I couldn't stop thinking about it the entire plane ride. And that's a long plane ride. Um, and I just was crying. Like I, I couldn't stop crying because I, I just felt like so, um, disappointed in myself and kind of ignorant. Like just the fact that I didn't, I was like, how could I have never thought about women not having access to these products like why wouldn't i why wouldn't that thought ever cross my mind um you start looking at your place of privilege you start looking at your place of privilege and kind of like being disappointed in yourself for not having paid attention to the outside world you know um and i never yeah and i never had that problem because i was like mm, pads and tampons were you know very present and um, plentiful. It was like toilet paper. You know, it was never a question of whether or not I would go a period without having one. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I thought this was like very actionable and, you know, if, if it wasn't going to be a great film for any reason, either way, I would have still, you know, done something and joined a movement. Um, and I just saw a lot of opportunity in it. Um, and so I, of course I said yes. And, you know, while I was in Scotland, I like, did a couple Skype calls with Garrett. And then when I got back, I had my first meeting with with the producers of the film. Um, <laughs> I entered into an English classroom at a high school in Los Angeles, met the English teacher who was going to be one of the producers on the film, Melissa Burton, the woman who now... Um, uh, uh, has an Oscar. <laughs> she, she was up on the stage with you, she right? Was, yeah, yeah. Melissa's our, yeah. Um, our producer. Garrett was a producer. Um, Lisa Tabak was a producer. Um, and uh, I was a producer as well. And then I, I, I walk into the room and I met meet our other producers, our executive, who will be our executive producers. And they're high school girls. Like they were like juniors in high school and seniors in high school. All girls. Um. They had some boys in the club too, but they didn't show up for that first meeting. <laughs> the girls basically were like, this is, this is like our thing. Like, this is what we focus all of our time and our energy on. Oh, this is Oak Ridge? This is Oakwood. Oakwood. Oakwood Oak, yeah. Oakwood, Oakwood School. Oakwood, yeah. In, okay. in Los Angeles. And, um, and it's an LA school. So there's all sorts of resources, you know, there's resources and access to Hollywood. So, um, so it's a good place to be, you know? Because if you're making a film with no budget, like you can try and pull favors and get resources. Um, and we had a lot of help and involvement from the community because they were so, I think, everyone was so passionate about this cause and also so motivated to see, like, when they saw that their daughters were so motivated, um, they, you know, people were just so inspired to step in and help out. Um so yeah, I mean, initially, I think the thought was like, let's make a, like a documentary and, you know, like it could have been like a YouTube video or something. Um, but I think we really saw the potential and like what this could be. And, you know, I was like, if I'm making my first documentary, like I, you know, I want this to be big. I want it to be like cinematic and beautiful and like 
I don't want it to be like other documentaries because I feel like a lot of times there are a lot of cinematic, like we didn't do anything groundbreaking here. There are a lot of cinematic documentaries that have like great story arcs and follow character and are beautiful and are entertaining and fun to watch. But there are also a lot of documentaries where you feel like you're being fed medicine. Um, And this is very a cause-based film. There's a cause behind it. There is a lot of information and research to like basically share. Um, because especially for Westerners, like this is the first time a lot of people have ever heard about this issue. So it's really important to not make this feel like a PSA, to not make it feel like, you know, there's a narrator and like people are feeding you information and there's title cards giving you all this statistics and stuff. Like I didn't want any of that. I wanted like, I wanted you to see a face and feel what she's experiencing and to, to really like root for her as she's fighting her way out of it. You had real characters. I mean, it, I don't know what, what the casting situation was and how that you know, what that process was, but you had, um, in the, the person who comes to mind the most is, is it Sneha? Is Sneha, it Sneha? Yeah. yeah. I mean, talk about charisma. She's amazing. Yeah. And, and just, um, I think she's going to be president one day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just rugged individualism she's and so cool. she doesn't yeah. let the culture, you know, define what her goals are going to be. And, um, but what an amazing cast. I mean, I, it's awkward to call it a cast because yeah. they're, they're just, they're subject, re, they're the subjects real, pe- of the film. Re, real yeah. people there. But, um, but I wanted yeah. it to be that way, like observational, like you go in there and there are so many personalities in there and these women have so much to say, you know, and, and it's like, I don't have to impose that narrative on them. They're just giving it to us. Um, and they're all so special. And these are all the women that just originally gravitated toward working on the machine. They're like the women that are like that are full time working on the machine now. Yeah. And I, I found I found when I was watching it that you really when you get rid of the distraction of the narrator and the, you know, the director inserting themselves, you know, whatever it is, the, you know, the cue cards or whatever. Um you you add a lot of credibility and heart and humanity to something that could be kind of overlooked as you know some you know some type of a um of dogma you know but this was really powerful um i i saw it at the uh, the sundance film festival oh, cool. up there awesome. and um i was i was watching it with um a bunch of other documentary shorts that were packed into this this evening in this auditorium and uh i i could not really um wrap my head around how you could pack so much into 26 minutes yeah because at the end i was i was crying mm-hmm. at the end of this movie and i'm like okay how does that happen how does that happen it's it's a foreign language film so i'm i'm reading subtitles <laughs> You know, and these are people that are not part of my culture, so it's probably more difficult for me to connect with them just as an American Mm and a place of privilege that I'm in. Um, But somehow you, you did it. So what, what was that process for you? And was it intentional? (laughs) Well, I didn't do it. I did it with, with your team, with my team and primarily with Sam, um, who is the unsung hero in all of this, because the. DP, editor, they never get the attention the way that the director or the producers do. Um, So I think it's really important to point out that he was absolutely instrumental in the process and that, you know, like the film was born out of um, basically, not born out of, but the film was constructed like in Sam's bedroom, like on his iMac. (laughs) We made it together. Like we would just like sleep, wake up, edit sleep, wake up, edit. (laughs) Like that was the process. Um, I think it was always intentional. Like me and Sam, you know, we both, we've been best friends, you know, we're a couple now we have been for two years. And, um, I think we just really get each other like on a creative and personal level. 
Um, and we both have the same sort of, I think, instincts when it comes to filmmaking. And um, we both just really value truth and realness. And I think we just both really wanted that in this film. Um, you know, we both knew that, like, we wanted this to be observational and that really, like, there is nothing that is more, I think, beautiful it makes you care more than like connecting to another human being on the screen. Um, and if you can do that, like you said, with a human being whose culture you don't share and language you don't share, then you've done something right. Um, and so that was intentional. Like we wanted to capture the soul of India, um, but have that be kind of in the background, you know, like the soul of India is captured like through the cuts and through the sound design things that are not like blatant um you know you hear like the sound of a rickshaw in the city and it's loud and it's chaos and it cuts to just like it's a hard cut to pure like silence and and all of a sudden you know that you're in the villages and you know that there's like this peace and this like order that's happening um that's like sound design and and cuts um, so, so we really wanted to kind of capture, capture all of that, um, through, I think every thread of, of filmmaking. Yeah. I mean, you, you can hear the industrial process of making the pads. I mean, there's, you, you really, yeah, sound plays a really big character. In it the, really does. Yeah, I mean, it take, film, I takes you in it and it's like, you, you feel like you're there in the room when mm -hmm. those machines are pushing down and, and then you, you hear the kind of the the shy kind of embarrassed laughter of the, the kids when they're asked, you know, what about, you know, their period or they ask the boys about it and like, what, I, yeah. I've heard about that. I yeah. don't know what it is, you know? And, um, but it's the reactions, the, the subtle, like little nuances of just capturing and observing, mm -hmm. like you say, it's observational. Um, it yeah. was made, made a powerful. I, I think too, like right off the bat, our gut was like no 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 no. we like this will not be a heavy dark sad film about like periods and how you know we are so like these women are so disadvantaged because of like their position in society and because of their periods and lack of access and like we want this to be empowering we want this to be uplifting it can be funny like it can, you know, it can be heartbreaking. Um, and like, it would be reductive to make a film that's just one-sided and dark and emotional because that's not like what the experience is. That's not what the human experience is. is. Human experience is complex. Like one second you're laughing, the next second you're crying. <laughs> I'm clearly proof of that today. <laughs> um, and, and we really wanted to capture that. And, um, and we did, I mean, it's not hard to do, you know, it's, it's really not when you're really like paying attention, it's not hard to do. Um, yeah. So I'm really glad. I mean, this is like what the outcome of the, you know, this is what the, how the film turned out to be because it feels like it hits all those notes. It's empowering. It's funny. It's, um, you know, has a certain pace and rhythm that's motivated and feels like women in charge. And um, and one of our executive producers called it the first time you ever watch it. He said it's a fist in the air. It's literally a fist in the air. Um, and it's funny because like that's our poster too. That that's what it ended up being is a fist in the air. That's so a few awesome. fists in the air. Yeah, yeah, it felt like a fist in the air. I yeah. mean, it just felt like. Uh, you know, you, you feel like the, these women have found a way to empower themselves, right? You know, and and they, I, I love the comment from the um, the principal toward the end where she talks about, I'm a little bit, a little bit feminist, you <laughs> just know? a little bit, <laughs> yeah. And um, that's so great because you know maybe right now in that culture, in this moment, you cannot. It's just not possible to be, you know, a full on hundred percent feminist because it just won't be tolerated or they're not ready or whatever, but it's nice to see that opening yeah. happening um, and to see these, and to also to see the men in the film, you know, I was kind of expecting the men to be more resistant to, and, and more I was averse too. to, I totally was too. Yeah. But they're really open to it. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I was like, you know, before we even went there, I was imagining a version in my head where like the man like walks in and is yelling at us and and um you know, is like pushing the women out and, and shutting down the whole operation. And, you know, that's like the cinematic version in your head. But I was surprised. I was like, they were quietly resistant. You know, they were like the women told the men that it was a Huggies machine at first. Um, I think some men maybe knew that it wasn't a Huggies machine. Um, but they showed resistance in that they didn't really want to talk to us about menstruation which is totally understandable. Like, yeah, you don't want to go on camera and talk about menstruation. That's fine. Um, but I think eventually, like, seeing the success of the pad machine, seeing that, like, their daughters and their wives were working and bringing money into the household and, like, were excited every day to, like, go to work and, and do this thing, um, I think they, like, really saw the power of it all. And I think they, you know, for the most part, like a lot of them are very supportive. Um, I think it's natural to like feel uncomfortable and shy away from it. I mean, hey, I felt uncomfortable before I started making this film talking about my period. I would have never in a million years imagined going on the stage at the Oscars in front of millions of people around the world and like basically talking openly about my period. Um, I would have never done that. Like, well, it's still in this culture. It's it's not something. I mean, in America, it's not something that we talk about openly. And right. and I think there's a certain degree of shame associated with it for women and young girls. And so I, I think it's not only important for us to understand their culture and how women are are having to drop out of school and and not getting the um, education they need in India, but I think it also, you, you kind of look back on our own culture. Mm -hmm. It forces you to kind of look at the shame that surrounds certain subjects that shouldn't be there, you know? Yeah. And also I think there's this really quick and easy assumption that, oh, you know, it happens in India. It doesn't happen in the United States. Like women aren't missing out on any type of education because of their periods in the U S it's just like, we're just ashamed. You know, we just start uncomfortable. That's all. And then you look, you dig deeper and you realize that, wait a minute, there was like a, a a machine that provided sanitary pads installed in a school, in a high school years ago. And attendance in the school from the women, from the females went up. Like it was a direct correlation. Um, and then you think about, you're like, okay, so there are women in lower income communities who actually have to miss school or actually really can't afford pads. And then I'm talking to young girls, um, who are from, who come from lower income communities and are like, oh yeah, I couldn't afford a tampon. I just like, um, I just use toilet paper and I just like wrap it up into a wad whenever I have to. And you're like, wow, the problem exists here too. It's just like almost more shameful to talk. <laughs> it's not more shameful, but we almost, we just have this, I think we're predisposed to think that, oh, we're America, like the United States, we were already privileged and these issues don't affect us, but they really do. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think I, my, my daughter was just talking to me the other day about a, a debate she was having in high school, English class or social studies about the tax on tampons. And uh, feminine hygiene projects are pro uh, products because um, the government has considered them to be luxury items, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. And um, and it, it, it's a reflection, I think, of how our culture looks at um, feminine issues, yeah. you know. So mm -hmm. the Pad Project was was that in place when you first met the, the high school kids? It was in the works. Okay. So we basically launched the PAD project, like the official nonprofit organization, like the producers on the film were all board members. I actually have like a board meeting next week for the PAD project. Um, we, yeah, we launched it like when we released the film and that was, you know, part of like get, gaining more exposure and being able to like, you know, create some traction. Um, but but basically, like the core, the work and the team of the Pad Project, like that existed even before 
it officially became a nonprofit, you know? Right. Yeah. So, and what has this film done for the pad project that you've seen? Has it gotten a lot more exposure? Yeah, of course. I mean, one argument we hear, which, ha- you know, was always a concern from the beginning is like a lot of parents would say this too, is why are we raising money on Kickstarter and not putting all that money toward buying another pad machine? Why are we putting that money toward buying, to toward making a film? And my argument now, and you know, it's all, it's been all of our arguments all along is like, be patient. This film will bring exposure to this issue and this topic, like to, to millions of people around the world. At least that was the initial goal. Um, and then we won't have problem getting funds for more pad machines. Like we might be able to buy in one more pad machine right now, but imagine the number of pad machines we can buy when there are people like in Nepal and in China, like all over the world having these conversations and aware of this. And then the film had this incredible, you know, journey um, after life where, you know, we did really well in film festivals and people were really responding well to it. Um, And then we got shortlisted for an Oscar and then we got nominated and then Netflix acquired the film. And now it's in like over 300 countries playing in 300 countries on Netflix. Um, It won the Oscar. It's like, I can't even imagine how many people have been watching this short film. Um, And that's the most valuable thing is like, we've started this really important, essential conversation around the world um, that we wouldn't have had if we had just purchased one other pad machine. You've you've built, literally built global awareness of this issue. Yep. And, Undoubtedly, people are probably donating to the padproject.org. Oh, yes, they are. I mean, it's been crazy. The donations are flying in and it's really great. I mean, we have a meeting next week because we really need to figure out how to like restructure um, to deal with all of this because, you know, it was born out of a classroom. Like we didn't realize that we would we would all of a sudden blossom and not blossom, like explode into this massive uh, organization. I mean, it's not, it's still small and it's still grassroots, still same people, but now we're having to deal with like all of these requests, all of these potential collaborations, all of these donations and, you know, trying to figure out where needs the most amount of pad machines and, you know, what, what's the best way to use the money? Like, so all of that, that stuff. The logistics of this shoot, um, how many days were you in the country? So we, Sam and I went to India twice, First time was right when the machine had been delivered. Um, so we were able to capture like the training on the machine and kind of the um, the mentality and thinking behind menstruation like before the machine was really a part of their lives. Um, so we were there for like three weeks. I think we only shot, or I'm sorry, two weeks. We only shot like a week. Second time we went back, it was six months after the machine had been installed and um, we captured the progress and that was like another seven day. We shot about two weeks worth of footage. It was 40 hours. And it was primarily you and Sam. Yeah. So me and Sam were the only ones I went to India and then we had a local crew there. Yeah. And so when you're waking up every morning and you're hopping on the iMac and, and cutting up this film, um, how much raw footage were you dealing with? How 40 many, hours. <laughs> four, 40 hours of raw 40 footage. 40 hours of raw footage and trying to kind of distill it down to its essence and and get it down to a short i mean there's it was definitely a moment where i was like we can make a feature film out of this like let's do let's just do like a 90 minute feature or something um but you start carving and you realize that really the best version of this story the sharpest the most like efficient um is is in 25 minutes it is and it took a lot of i think advice and eyeballs to sort of help us get to that place was it painful to cut? of course yeah yeah because you you're killing your darlings you know it's always really hard to do that um because you're so precious about everything um yeah but you just have to focus on exactly what is needed you do and to move that narrative forward exactly yeah and um, I think it was shocking to us to realize that wow you really can jam pack all of that in 25 minutes and not have it feel like it was truncated in in any way or 
reductive in any way. Like it, you know, it, it feels like it flows, you know? So you get it down to 25 minutes. When did you realize, when, when was the first moment that you realized that this was something really special? Uh, like the, I think like final cut, like when me and Sam watch it in his apartment, we literally looked at each other and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, there was always like, do you think Oscars? Do you think? I don't know. But like our first goal was like, let's just get into Tribeca. Let's like, we really want to get into Tribeca Film Festival. And then we didn't um, because, well, I don't know what the reason is, but we also submitted like a really rough cut to Tribeca because we were just not done at all making the film. Um, so first goal was like, let's just get into like a major festival um, and like see where it goes. But, you know, w like we had experienced Madaran in festivals and it's really like hard to gauge. I mean, some audiences in some places will respond to your film. Some audiences in some places won't respond well to your film. And these film festivals are really trying to cater to their audiences. You know, it's sometimes not as much about what the programmers tastes are as much as it is about who they're programming for. Um, so there was definitely a concern of like, okay, this is a film about menstruation. Like, we really hope that half of the country isn't going to ignore this film. Um, and they didn't. I mean, it was, you know, it was a really good festival run and people were really responsive. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this, this movie and it's, Thank uh, you. it's, yeah. I, <laughs> well, I, I just, um, I, I'm fascinated that this is something that nobody has really known about up until your movie came out. I mean, the, uh, the cultural, um, inhibitions and, um, the power of filmmaking. Yeah. I, but it, the, uh, the people that I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to, um, deeply religious people, um, when I was in Utah, talking to a lot of Mormons about this movie and, and it, the response has been just universally, um, great. I mean, they're, they're like, I need to see this movie or I have seen this movie or I saw it and I told my wife, we have to watch it, you know? And, um, it's, it's pretty cool to see so many people connecting, um, on an issue like this yeah. that you would think would be maybe more, you know, a, you know, I guess, uh, the demographic would be a female audience that would be interested in this, but I haven't found that to be the case. No. I mean, Sam always says this and I love it because he was like one of the few men really, you know, who pushed this project forward. He's, he's like, he always says like men are 50% of the population, you know, this is a movie for women, for men, just as much as it is for women, because if men are not allies and men are not, you know, also sparking these conversations with other men, like we haven't solved, we haven't solved the issue. Um, so, yeah, and I think that's a really important point. Right. So when did the Oscar campaign begin in your mind? When did you start thinking this is possible? Um, well, I mean, we thought it was possible. Our first film festival when we did Cleveland International Film Festival, that was our premiere, and we won the jury award, which qualified us for the Oscars at Cleveland, which is really remarkable because sometimes you go – you know, eight months, you do your entire festival run and you never get that one qualifying jury award. You win tons of awards, but it's never the one. So it was really amazing that we, you know, we had that right out of the gate and it made it possible for us. Um, and then we won another Oscar qualifying jury award at Traverse City Film Festival, which is Michael Moore's Film Festival. Awesome festival we won that there and we were like double qualified, which is crazy. I mean, that like, that doesn't happen very often. Um, and then like right before the shortlist, um, we were accepted to AFI Fest, which is like a really big festival. And I think gives you a lot of visibility as well. And Savannah SCAD film festival, um, you know, those festivals give you a lot of visibility and, uh, and, and at that point, I think we were like, okay, we're, we're gaining a lot of momentum and like, it feels like bigger and bigger entities are responding and watching. And hopefully that'll give us enough visibility so that we can get on the short list. 
Um, cause the, the, the difficulty about getting on just the Oscar shortlist is visibility. Like there's so many great films out there, shorts that so many people just don't see because they don't have, they're not visible. You know, they don't have distribution or just not enough people are watching because, you know, people don't prioritize short films. So once you start to get attention from big festivals, I think it really helps with that visibility and the buzz and people, you know, word of mouth and people talking about it. Nice. Yeah. So Savannah, and then when did you find out that you actually, you talked about a short list. I don't know what the short list <laughs> is, but. Yeah. So basically like there's a whole process. So in order to qualify to even submit to the Oscars, you have to win an Oscar qualifying a jury award at a specific Oscar qualifying film festival. And I think there's 80 of them or something, or maybe less. Um, there's only like 80 or so film festivals that the Academy has like approved and said, these are Oscar qualifying festivals. You can't just win any award. You have to win the Oscar qualifying award at the Oscar qualifying film festival. Um, and then once you qualify, I think that narrows it down to like 160 or something short documentaries um, where there were, you know, probably thousands and thousands before. Uh, and then, and then the Oscar voters will vote, um, out of those 160 and decide on a 10 film shortlist. So once you've made the shortlist, then it becomes, a uh, you know, mad dash to, to, um, to get the film in front of more people and hopefully get, you know, more votes so that you can be nominated, be one of the five nominated films. Wow. So, so the shortlist is 10 long. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, is that when the actual campaign starts when you, yeah. you're you trying to yeah, really get the word out? I think you're out? kind of campaigning beforehand too, because you're really trying to put the film in front of people. And yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I was like sobbing. We all were sobbing when we found out we made the shortlist because I maybe to answer your question, maybe that was the moment where we're like, wow, we're, this is real. The Oscars, like this, there's actually a chance here because when you're 160 films, it's still like, you know anything can go. But when it's 10 films, it's, it feels a lot more serious and a lot more real. So when in the year was that? Was that 2000? That was December, that was like December. 2018. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's, it all happens so quickly. Yeah. I can't even believe like it was just a few months ago. So does that mean that everyone on your, like every producer on your team is nominated as well? Like No. You know. So with shorts, they're very strict about like, there's only, it's only the director and then uh, maybe one producer. Um, so Melissa then? Yeah. So yeah. so it was Melissa. Um, yeah. So you, only two people get nominated and only two people get the Oscars. And, you know, it's like you wish everybody could and you want it to be a very inclusive process. Unfortunately, it's not. Right. Um, but, you know, you have to kind of keep the uh, – I, I think you can't, you can't be, like, blinded. Um, you can't – like lose sight of of what it is that you're doing in the mission of the film you know uh like it's not about the oscars it's really not and it's so incredible because it's giving you so much exposure but it's not giving you so much so much exposure as much as it's giving the film so much exposure and this caused so much exposure like that was such an incredible experience to see how people all over the world were responding so what was that build up like between December and, uh, was it March? Was it early, uh, early February March? 24th? For, it was late, late February. Yeah. Um, it was just like you hit the ground running and it's like you, you're just nonstop every single day, full time committed to this Oscar campaign. Like I didn't work during that time. I did, I shot like a, me and Sam did a, a short documentary for the special Olympics, which we're currently editing right now, which is awesome. Um, but but aside from that, like we didn't, you know, it was like fully being committed to this campaign because you're doing press and you're doing events and you're screening the film at tons of different places. And it's just like conversation with people. And it really just become like takes over your life for those, you know, two or three months. And then does anybody prepare you for the evening itself to tell you yeah. like what <laughs> yeah. what to do and where to sit and, and yeah, what's aware like orchestrated you know 
Um, it's a well-oiled machine. And, you know, luckily Netflix had acquired the film right when we got nominated. So we had Netflix's campaign, awards campaign and um, publicity team, which is like the best in the world. Yeah. Truly is. Um, and uh, there was a lot of guidance and help there, you know, to try to like make this uh, process like not feel daunting (laughs) yeah there's a lot of good support like we felt really supported we really did and so the kids that helped with the film the high school kids were they part of that evening at all yeah no longer high school kids i mean um a lot of them are like in college now but um the core team was there yeah the core the core group of girls who started like the whole movement they um, all flew out from, you know, all over the country and came to attend the Oscars. And then the coolest thing was to have our friends from India, like our producers from India and like the subjects of the film and our friends from Action India, which is the organization that we worked with in Delhi, um, who gave us access to the villages. They were, it was like six, six people who were able to come out here oh my to gosh. the Oscars That's as well. So cool. And like Sneha was there. Like it was. Sneha was there? Sneha was there and it was her first time. Like she lives two hours from Delhi in the villages and she had never even been to Delhi, which is a major city. Oh so my gosh. yeah, she came to Los Angeles, Hollywood. Academy Awards. She was very overwhelmed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and it was like just so much fun. Yeah. Is she, do you know if she's um, made it into the police Academy or not? She's still waiting. Yeah. But like, she's like a celebrity now. Like (laughs) people are honoring her and like, you know, she's really becoming very well respected and powerful in like in a much bigger community all over India. Um, so hopefully, you know, she can achieve that, that dream, if not more. Yeah. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. So, um, and I, I'm sorry if I'm asking too many Oscar related questions, <laughs> okay. cause this is just so cool to, I've never talked to anybody <laughs> who's been through this process. Um, so you're there at the Oscars mm-hmm. and there's, you know, five people up for this award mm-hmm. and, um, what, what were your thoughts about your chances of actually winning i was numb i wasn't thinking about it which i know sounds crazy but i was just like numb to it i like went i turned into a stone because i didn't want to i don't know i think i was just really nervous and anxious and you know it's like the most feels like one of the most important times of your life up until this point and um and I was like, I'm not going to throw up. I'm not going to have a panic attack right now. I'm not going to just like burst out into tears constantly because I would normally. Um, I was just like, nope, totally like unfazed by it all. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, the red carpet was um, like a lot smaller than I thought it would be. And wow, like Dolby Theater is a lot smaller. This whole thing is like, wow, really? Inter- I really felt like I was on the outside looking in. Like I really, truly did. Um, and then like when we ran up on the stage, it's like, I just, my, my, I just went blank. (laughs) Well, it didn't seem like you went blank. I mean, it it seemed, it seemed like you were a natural up there. (laughs) I mean, just so full of energy. I mean, blank, like you're, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't like edited. I wasn't like in my head. I just was like, it just poured out of me and it was just pure emotion. That's yeah. And I think it was also like what I, I was able to let go of after like a whole evening of just being like bottled up and yeah it's like silent and just like a cold <laughs> i recorded it on my cell phone it was just like oh, sitting cool. there and then i Thank texted you. um texted to afterwards and i was just like she did it i can't <laughs> believe it it's so cool to uh to see that happening yeah to someone and my mom you, was there yeah. which is amazing oh yeah yeah i wish i could have brought the rest of my my sister and the rest of my family but they were at the netflix viewing party um and then we met with them right after the yeah. Oscars. But my mom was there. My mom was like in the balcony. How did she handle it all? I mean, like I asked her like literally a week later, I was like, so mom, what was your reaction? Cause I didn't have a phone. Like my phone was in my purse and my purse was left, you know, at the seat when I ran up on stage and then you go backstage and you do press for like an hour backstage. There's like so much stuff happening back there. So I literally was like away from my phone for two hours. I didn't like get a chance to talk to anybody um 
So I was like, I asked the week, I'm like, mom, what was your reaction? She's like, oh my God, I couldn't stop <laughs> screaming. I was sobbing. And she's like, I kept screaming even after your category. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. So what's next for you? Uh, so this has been a really interesting and cool kind of rebuilding period for me. Um I almost feel like I, I'm starting anew. Like it almost feels like I'm right out of film school and I'm just starting from scratch again, which is crazy to think, but it's true. I mean, um, I uh, I just signed to like an incredible pr uh, commercial production company. It's like one of my favorite companies, some of my favorite people, Pretty Bird. Um, and I'm a director on their roster now, which is awesome. And I'm so excited about. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's like, I'm really excited about that. And um, I have my wonderful agents and they're all, um, you know, setting meetings for me. And uh, I have a few projects um, that I can't really talk about. They're like a couple of documentary features that I'm um, like developing, um, which one I'll do. I don't know yet. Um, and then I have a narrative feature that's about my Iranian family immigrating from Iran to the United States in the nineties, kind of in the vein of little miss sunshine. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I still want to make documentaries and I still want to make narrative films. I don't want to like pigeonhole myself in any way. And yeah. I make commercials, like why not? Well, and you got a lot, it sounds like you've got a lot to choose from. Yeah. I mean, know, a lot of opportunities. I need to, I need to have an income. <laughs> <laughs> It's always funny to think like you won the Oscar and like you're set and it's like, no, I have like no money. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, you know documentary. It'll, it'll pour, it'll start to, you know, as I start getting the projects up and going, um, you know, it'll start to get a little bit more comfortable, hopefully. But um, I think that's just like when you pri prioritize the stories and you prioritize the heart and the cause and the mission, like when you're doing it for those reasons, the money is like always kind of left out and forgotten, you right. know, and you need to start to like bring that in because you can't survive without it. So, um, so I'm starting to think that way a little bit more. Um, but I think still, no matter what, you know, whatever path my career takes, it's, it's going to be something that, you know, the projects I do will be rooted in social activism. they will be like, I'm not going to do, I'm getting a lot of offers to do a lot of projects. Um, and I'm not taking a lot of them because I'm not interested or invested in them. I could because it'll bring me money and it'll, you know, continue to build on this momentum. But that's not as important to me as um, just like being truthful and kind of, you know, like true to yourself. Yeah. I hate following to sound your, cliche, but really true to yourself. Well, you're following your passion um, and which is story. And that's not always going to take you to yeah. money. Tell um, the story, Dave Junker. I always yeah. remember from my film ed days. Tell the story. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the Oscar, Thank on the you. film, the you know the success of the Pad Project. Um, what an amazing story! And thanks for sitting down with me. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. <laughs> it's All a right. great conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Dream Path Podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time. And as always, go find your dream path.